I thought my life was perfect until that night. I walked into our hotel room and found her with him. My heart shattered into a million pieces. Rage boiled within me, consuming every rational thought. How could she betray me? I gave her everything, and she threw it all away for a fleeting moment of passion. As I confronted them, I saw fear in her eyes, but it was too late. The love I once felt turned into a burning desire for revenge. This is my story of betrayal, confrontation, and the dark path I took to reclaim my shattered soul. Tomorrow is my birthday. I have to make the hardest choice of my life. What I decide will change everything, maybe forever. I know what I should do. I know what she wants me to do. Sorry, I'm really stressed. Let me start over. Tomorrow is my birthday and I'm scared. I have a big decision and I don't know what to do. What would you do if you were me? This all started last month. No, it goes back five years. Actually, to understand, I need to take you back to when my mom was pregnant with me. My parents had just moved to Pflugerville, Texas, and my mom was feeling lonely. Lorelai's parents met mine in a Lamaze class. They lived just a block away in one of those new neighborhoods popping up around Austin. You know the type, big houses on small lots in a planned community with a clubhouse and pool. Both our families moved to Austin for tech jobs and the term yuppie fits them perfectly. Our moms became best friends. Our dads got along well too. Lorelai was born two days after me and we spent more time together than most twins. We never had separate birthday parties. We went to the same daycare, preschool, and were in every class together until junior high when they separated us for health class. We became best friends even before preschool. In second grade, Lorelai's dad died in a plane crash. I held her while she cried for hours. Her mom never remarried, and Lorelai often spent more time with my dad than I did. I liked hunting, but dad loved fishing. I found fishing boring. Lorelai wasn't a morning person, except when dad wanted to go fishing. She had her own key to our house before I did and would be sitting at our kitchen table before sunrise. I never asked Lorelai out. We just started dating when she decided she wanted a boyfriend. Lorelai was very determined. If she wanted something, she got it, and she wanted me. We had other friends and were popular. Lorelai was class president all four years of high school. We were prom king and queen. We both ran track and played soccer. At the University of Texas, we both played soccer. Lorelai had a big scholarship, and I played on the club team where we won a few national championships. We were in the prestigious Plan 2 program. Lorelai studied pre-law, and I was into computers. Halfway through our junior year, we had a pregnancy scare. Lorelai decided we should get married the next summer. I guess that's where this story really begins. Lorelai was the only girl I ever dated, kissed, or wanted to be with. I was crazy about her. Saying we were happy those first two years is an understatement. The sun didn't rise. It appeared when Lorelai opened her eyes. We were poor, as only married college kids can be, but we didn't care. I got into UT's MBA program. Lorelai got into UT Law School. We felt like a team ready to change the world until that OU weekend. The entire second-year class of UT Law School was invited to a luxury retreat owned by a big Texas law firm for OU Weekend. For those who don't know about OU Weekend, it's a big deal. Even we Texans admit that the OU Sooners know how to play football, but they aren't polite enough to respect us Longhorns. The game happens in Dallas, halfway between the two schools, and the stadium is divided between Sooners and Longhorns. Because of the game, you can't find a hotel room within a hundred miles of Dallas. The fans pack the streets, and you have to know how to handle it, or you'll be in trouble. The law firm's hotel and services on OU Weekend are way beyond what most law students can afford. It's a recruiting tactic that keeps the firm at the top of the list for UT's best students. On Friday night, the firm threw a big party with an open bar and tons of fancy food. I had to attend class on Friday, so I couldn't leave Austin until after four. With all the traffic, the trip would take at least twice as long as usual. I would miss the fancy dinner, but hope to make it for some dancing and drinks. Lorelai had gone up in the morning with a professor she met that summer. Lorelai had been so taken by him that she signed up for a fall class. We both felt surprised when he invited us to his lake mansion for dinner a week before the game. I felt a bit sorry for him even while admiring his house. He had been divorced for a year and seemed lonely. I liked him. He was about our parents' age but seemed more refined. 
When he heard about my class conflict, he offered Lorelei the ride. Lorelei was excited when we got home. She couldn't stop talking about the chance to pick his brain during the long drive. I had just sat down in class that Friday when I started fidgeting. All I could think about was getting to Dallas. This wasn't my first OU game, so I didn't understand why I was so nervous. About ten minutes into the class, the professor noticed and said, You're as bad as my husband. Go on, get out of here. Try to beat the traffic to that silly game. At that moment, I felt like everything was perfect. The game was the next day, but I was desperate to see Lorelei. I had packed everything and was on the highway fifteen minutes later. The traffic was terrible, but I reached the hotel a little before seven, just as everyone was having dinner. The hotel was even fancier than I had imagined, but something felt off about Lorelei, who was sitting across from her professor. They were deep in conversation and didn't notice me until I touched her shoulder. She jumped and quickly mentioned that our room had fancy sheets. Then she blushed, which was so unlike her. The panic I had been feeling since class started to rise. Before I could ask her what was wrong, a band began to play. The professor stood up and asked Lorelei to dance. I always thought I wasn't the jealous type. Jealousy comes from mistrust, and I trusted Lorelei completely. Besides, he was old enough to be my dad, but Lorelei accepted his invitation without looking at me. My adrenaline spiked and it hit me when I looked at them on the dance floor. They danced normally, not too close or too far. Nothing seemed out of place. But in that tiny moment, I knew she had been with him. It was such a foreign idea, but it settled in my mind quickly. I knew it like I've always known the special things about Lorelei. I felt it deep down, and then I was gone. I never believed in temporary insanity until then. I'm glad I didn't have my gun with me because the next thing I knew, I was back at home, taking it out of our bedside table. To this day, I don't remember leaving the hotel, leaving Dallas, or driving back to Austin. Standing next to our bed, I had a vivid image of him with her. It felt so real, as if I could feel him inside me. Shaking with pain and anger, I yelled, Why? All my life, I had given Lorelei everything. Even as kids, if Lorelei wanted something, I got it for her without thinking. I gave myself completely. Why wasn't that enough? The burning pain rose from my soul. Lorelei had always been the one who comforted me, who made things better. I grabbed my phone without thinking to call her. There were three voicemails from Lorelei. The first message had her asking, Where are you? Is something wrong? The second was more commanding, telling me I had to let her explain. I would have complied if I hadn't heard the third message. A sobbing Lorelei begged me to understand that this had nothing to do with me, that we would get past it. Who was this woman I thought I knew so well? I could always finish her sentences, knew what she would cook, what she would wear, and her deepest fears. How could she think this didn't affect me? A sharp pain gripped my chest. I collapsed on the bed. Was it possible I didn't know her at all? She had been with another man and kept it from me. I could never have done that to her. But she did. I didn't know how long their affair had been. Then I remembered her comment about the sheets, and I threw up all over our bed. I don't know how long I sat there covered in my own mess. It didn't matter. Nothing made sense anymore. The pain was so intense, I can't describe it. It grew and grew until I would have begged for death. It was that unbearable. Then it changed. My world, once colorful and full of sound, turned black and white and filled with harsh noise. I hated it. I blinked, trying to bring back what I had lost, but all I saw in my soul was molten pain from my personal hell. I blinked again and my pain turned into something worse, something that ate at my very being. My phone rang. It was from her. I froze. By the time I could move, it went to voicemail. Without thinking, I listened to the message. It was him. He didn't sound his usual self. He sounded scared. Your wife just collapsed in front of my room. She had been pounding on my door, crying like crazy. Look, I'm, uh... He stopped for a while before speaking again. I think your wife is having a breakdown. I'll call a friend at Timberlawn Mental Health. He can get her into their trauma program. You need to call Timberlawn. I'll take her there, okay? I didn't move, and it hurt me deeply. I knew Lorelai was hurting, too. Her pain was even worse because she knew she had caused both of our pains. My instincts told me to go to her, but I couldn't. The pain was too much, the loss too great, the anger too intense. My pain felt like a river of lava between us, and I couldn't cross it no matter how much I wanted to. A priceless diamond had shattered into pieces. 
The vomit smelled bad. I looked around the room and saw how few things we owned. I had always felt so rich, thinking our tiny apartment was perfect because I shared it with her. Now, with new eyes, I saw it was old and filled with things our families didn't want. It made me feel sick. All we had was in Dallas, so I grabbed a trash bag and threw in my remaining clothes. There weren't many, and then I left. I think I lost my mind again or something like that. I remember bits of stopping for gas, grabbing fast food, and napping at rest stops. But my next clear memory was sitting in my car looking at the ocean and not knowing where I was or which ocean I was seeing. I vaguely remembered heading towards Houston, but this didn't look like the Gulf. I saw just the tip of the sun straight ahead. I didn't know if it was rising or setting, but figured I was on either the east or west coast. As I sat there, it got lighter and the sun came up. I decided I was on the east coast. I still wasn't very curious. I don't know how long I sat there, but as the sun rose, it burned away my mental fog. My car was full of fast food trash and my cell phone was hiding in a big cup. For a long time, I tried to go back to wherever I had been when I drove here, but in the new day's light, I couldn't. I was just an empty shell of a man, but what was left of me was awake and aware. As I sat there, I realized that if I was going to move forward, it had to be without Lorelei, and that felt so unfair. Maybe a better man could have done something else. Maybe if I had more courage, I might have tried to save something from the wreck of our marriage. Maybe if the pain had been less, I could have faced her. But I was the man she left, and I ran away. I called our family lawyer. His secretary, who had known me all my life, said, Good morning, so I knew the weekend was over. I asked for Mr. Murdoch. When he got on the line, I told him I needed divorce papers. I said I would tell him where to send my copies once I knew where I'd be. I think I'd still be on the phone if my battery wasn't dying. I almost shouted, If you can't do this, Mr. Murdoch, I'll call someone else as soon as I charge my phone. Mr. Murdoch is a nice man, but no lawyer can resist fresh trouble. He agreed just before my phone died. A surprised clerk at a gas station told me I was in Jacksonville, Florida. I'd never been there, and unless something forces me, I'll never go back. I'm sure it's a nice place, but I don't want to visit the darkest time of my life again. I found I-95 and headed north for a new life. Somewhere in South Carolina, I plugged in my phone to charge. Somewhere in North Carolina, I called my parents. Dad wasn't home, and Mom was worried. After I told her I was safe, she started telling me about Dad going to get Lorelei from Timberlawn. Just hearing her name caused me so much pain that I almost lost control of my car. I told Mom I couldn't bear to hear her name again. When she said it again, I hung up and turned off my phone. I took a wrong turn at Chester, Pennsylvania, and didn't realize it until I saw signs for the Pennsylvania Turnpike. I pulled into a gas station, and my card was declined at the ATM. I shrugged and drove around looking for help wanted signs. I found a job flipping burgers before I ran out of gas. I explained my situation to the manager and I lived off the menu and in my car until I got my first check. I called Mr. Murdoch as soon as I had an address for the papers. He still couldn't believe Lorelei had cheated on me, but he filed the papers. As I was an old family friend, it only cost me more than I would make in a month flipping burgers. My parents were worse. They wouldn't even listen to my accusation. I told them to ask her. After that, Dad wanted to know what I had done to make her act that way, and Mom wanted me to forgive her. I tried to explain that just hearing her name gave me all the symptoms of a migraine and even made my teeth hurt. I begged them not to say her name again. Dad did, so I hung up and threw my phone into a river I passed. Using a pay phone, I called the dean at UT to arrange to leave school. I was allowed to withdraw without harm to my record. That meant if I ever wanted to go back... I could finish my MBA at UT. It didn't mean I got any money back. It also meant the clock was ticking on my six-month grace period for student loans. It took almost a month, but I found a good job at a software security company. The work was fascinating. Our company didn't deal with fleeting problems like viruses. We focused on encryption, codes, and keeping secrets safe. We protected important data and information. I only understood how much Laurel I knew me when I got my signed papers. She hadn't tried to call me even once after those three calls that night. I wouldn't have answered, but it still stung. Being alone was new to me. I had Lorelai and my parents by my side my entire life. Now, I wished I had siblings, someone in my corner. It was just before Thanksgiving and I spent the holiday trying to stop my heart from freezing over. Two weeks after my divorce, on a Friday, 
I went to a fertility clinic to check on their setup. Suddenly, I saw the name Lorelei on a patient chart. My heart ached, and I almost felt sick. Of course, it wasn't her, but I had never met another Lorelei before. Her parents had chosen the name because it was rare. I've never felt as low as I did at that moment. I didn't know I could feel so sad and alone. The only person in Texas who knew where I was was Mr. Murdoch. He thought I was in Pittsburgh since I made him promise not to tell anyone. I was actually living near the King of Prussia Mall, close to Philadelphia. It was a cold, wintry day, but I hardly noticed. My soul felt darker and colder. I'm going to die soon without a heart transplant. I'm not sad about it. What's your excuse? I turned around and blinked. In front of me stood the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Her smile was bright and welcoming. You've heard of someone having an inner glow? She had it. She seemed almost otherworldly. I can't say everything was colorful again, but for the first time since Dallas, I knew colors still existed. Have you ever had a private meeting with someone important, like the president or the pope? I once met the pope before he was the pope. I'm not Catholic, but my family and Lorelei's were touring Italy after her father died. We visited the Vatican and had a private meeting because of some family connection. I didn't understand the man's beliefs, but I knew he had a special presence. I felt the same way about this woman. While I wondered why, she kept smiling and said, I'm going to let you take me to dinner tonight. Pick me up at 6.30. I'll choose where we go then. You've got time to sort out your troubles and we'll tackle them together. I was shocked. Why would you want to have dinner with me? I blurted out. Because you're the most interesting man I've met in ages. No one should look as sad as you do on such a beautiful day. Look at the blue sky. It's been so long since we've seen that. It's a promise of new life. You're in a place where life begins. How can you not feel the joy? I found the place depressing. Couples desperate to have a child grabbing one last chance. I wondered how I knew she wasn't married and was here as a patient. But all I said was, I don't think I'll be good company, but I'd love to take you to dinner. Her smile brightened even more as she kindly said, Thank you, I didn't want to eat alone tonight. She was genuinely grateful, and even though I was the lucky one, she didn't see it that way. I was about to ask her name when a nurse called, Cindy Aaron, we're ready for you now. Suddenly, she grabbed my hand with a strong grip, closed her eyes, and mumbled something I couldn't hear. After a few moments, she embraced me, not a hug or a passionate hold, but a very intimate gesture. And then she left. I realized too late that while I knew her name, I didn't know how to contact her. Looking her up in the clinic's computer was out of the question. It would be unethical. I had finished my job there and had no reason to investigate. Frozen in indecision, I smiled when Cindy burst out the door and said, A-H-R-E-N, I'm the only Cindy Aaron in the book, maybe the world, and she was gone again. Think of the cliches. The weight of the world lifted off my shoulders. The clouds of gloom parted. There was a new bounce in my step. They all were true. Even the office felt different. People were smiling at me, something I hadn't seen before. My MS outlook showed many calls and emails to respond to. The first time I was put on hold, I used the time to find Cindy. I was curious about her comment, so I searched for errands on Yahoo and found only 43 in the whole country. I had just found her name and was copying her address and number when my boss showed up at my cubicle. He asked if I could come to his office for a few minutes once I was done with my call. When I got to his office, he asked me to close the door. Chris, first let me say you're doing a great job. Even in this talented group, your work stands out but I need to ask a tough question. One of the reasons I hired you was because you listed some interesting awards you got in high school. Now, I won't say we were all geeks in school, but I hope to move you into a sales engineer role. Your work here is valuable, so I don't mind if you embellished a little on your application, but I need to know why. It took me a few seconds to realize he thought I'd lied about being Mr. PHS and Prom King, Honestly, I didn't remember writing that on my resume, and I didn't know why I would. Those are true. I guess I could get my mom to send my old high school yearbook if you want. His eyes narrowed. Chris, I know you're smart, but you've never shown the people skills I'd expect from someone who was popular in high school. His voice trailed off, and before I knew it, I started talking about Lorelei and me. I didn't say her name, but it still hurt to talk about. I almost cried. When I finished... I could see sympathy in his eyes. I wasn't sure I wanted it, but I felt better. 
You've never spoken to her at all? It wouldn't matter. She never called me, and even if I could forgive her, I couldn't trust her. I thought she couldn't lie to me, but she had an affair and I didn't see it coming. How do I know she wasn't seeing him more? If someone cheats once, they could do it again. I snorted. Besides, if just reading her name gives me a headache, what do you think talking to her would do to me? He didn't offer me the sales job. He didn't mention anything about getting help, but in the stuff he gave me was a copy of our health care coverage. The part about counseling was highlighted. There was also a sheet showing what I'd make if I could get the position. I was shocked. I had no idea salespeople made that much money. The rest of the day felt really strange. I'd been on autopilot for so long that I had trouble with simple tasks. It was like one of those old movies where they show double images to show someone's drunk. Everything looked familiar and new at the same time. As soon as I could leave, almost at six, I rushed home. I didn't have much time to get ready before I was driving to Cindy's place. I was a few minutes late when I rang her apartment and she buzzed me in. Her place was on the fourth floor, and as I rode the elevator it hit me that I was going on a date, and I still hadn't asked a girl out. The thought sent a chill through me. I might not have gotten off the elevator if Cindy hadn't been standing right there when the doors opened. I saw her and said, My God, you're beautiful. When she smiled, I noticed she had three dimples, one on each side and a cute little one on her chin. She tapped my nose with her finger. Chris, you should never use the Lord's name when you're joking. It makes it into a different kind of sin, you know. But I appreciate your effort. She hooked her arm in mine and led me back into the elevator. I'm going to let you decide tonight. We can go to a great family-style Italian place nearby. Or if you want to go first class, we can have the best hoagies and cheesesteaks in the city, if you're up for it. I wasn't a fan of the hard crust they use here on their sub sandwiches, so I chose the Italian place. But this was the second time she'd mentioned her heart. I hadn't thought much of it at the clinic because who goes to a fertility clinic if they need a heart transplant? I opened my mouth to ask, but she shook her head gently and said, Not yet, Chris. Wait until we get to the restaurant, then we can share our life stories and see who has the saddest one. Her eyes sparkled, and with a playful smile, she added, since the first liar never stands a chance, you have to go first. As we walked to my car, we talked about nothing in particular, probably sports. Cindy loved all the Philly teams, but hockey was her favorite. I knew as much about hockey as Cindy did about rodeo, a secret passion of mine. But as she talked about last night's hockey game, I hung on every word. At the restaurant, she got me talking between ordering and the soup arriving. For the second time, I told my life story and my sadness. I even told her about how just hearing her name made me angry. I let her see my pain. Somehow it didn't hurt as much as it did earlier. Holding her hand across the table might have helped. By the end, I felt better. If talking to my boss had been like a dam bursting, talking to Cindy was like soothing my pain. I hadn't realized how raw my wounds were until I felt her gentle questions. She was gentle but persistent. She was a surgeon, making sure she cleaned out anything that might stop the healing. When she was done removing the last bad bit, I leaned back and sighed deeply. I felt better than I had since that Friday afternoon in class. Also, the meal was the best Italian food I'd ever had. I needed to try places other than Olive Garden. This food was amazing, even if I didn't know what it was. Cindy was leaning forward over the table, holding my hand. Her eyes were shining, and if she hadn't been smiling so wide, I would have thought she was about to cry. After she ordered dessert, I said, Now you know all my sad story. I need to know about your heart issues. What kind of person am I getting involved with? She cut in. Oh, we're getting involved, are we? I guess that means on our next date you'll take me to meet your folks. This whole thing must be hard for them. Your ex was like a daughter to them, right? I thought it would hurt more to talk about this, but it was surprisingly easy and didn't hurt much. Yeah, we both had three parents. We both called my mom, mom, and her mom, mama. Dad was dad for both of us, but her dad was daddy to us until he died. I haven't talked to them since I got here, except once. They wanted me to see her, and I just couldn't. It really hurts knowing your own parents aren't on your side. I'm not sure if I'm welcome home. We can wait on the meet the parents trip, then. What did they say about the knife you left in her professor's door? I blushed. I hadn't meant to tell her that. 
At some point, I had driven my five-inch hunting knife deep into his front door. Mr. Murdoch said it had given him a lot of stress. Maybe it was good he was in Dallas with my wife at the time. I felt my anger rising, but looking at Cindy made it go away. That's the last dodge, Cindy. I need to know about you. Everything. I don't know how you got me talking about myself like this, but I'm not saying another word until you tell me your story. She gave a crooked smile. A while ago, I got my dream job in Africa. I caught a rare disease. It's hurting my heart. I have heart failure, but it's not as bad as I made it sound this morning. So why were you at a fertility clinic? She blushed. I want children, and my chances don't look great. I'm almost past the point where I can take fertility drugs. I wanted to save some of my eggs just in case. It's so embarrassing. We haven't even kissed. And here I am talking about babies. But she wasn't blushing. She was glowing. Are you really waiting for a heart? Yeah, it's possible, but I'm not high on the list yet. At my age, I'll move up quickly if it becomes my only option. So why were you at the clinic? Are you one of the anonymous donors? I don't blush often, but this time I turned bright red. No, I'm a computer nerd. I was there checking our security software. Part of my job is making sure that those who want to stay anonymous can. I started to say, if I ever have kids, I want them the old way. But I realized she wouldn't have been there if she had much hope of that. I changed the topic to hockey, and before I knew it, the evening was gone. Before saying goodnight, we agreed to have breakfast. By the end of Saturday, I agreed to meet her at her church on Sunday. I've never gone to church much. My dad was a Presbyterian but got mad at some of their stances, and my mom was a non-active Lutheran. We went on Christmas and Easter. I went to confirmation class, but most Sundays we were at soccer games. Even if I had been a regular churchgoer, I'd have been nervous to go with Cindy. She was preaching. She was Dr. Cindy Aaron, a fully ordained Methodist elder. She had worked in Africa as a teacher at a seminary. She also taught pastoral theology at a Lutheran seminary in Philadelphia. At 29, she was the youngest teacher there. But it was clear to see she was special. I had prepped myself to praise a sermon I couldn't follow. But instead of a sermon, she talked about the role of hope in everyday life. She shared stories from her job as a chaplain at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It's one of the top children's hospitals, meaning there are some really tough cases. By the end of the service, I felt out of my depth. I'm smart, but not at Cindy's level, and the idea of dating a minister made me uneasy. If we got serious, I'd be the preacher's spouse. I knew preacher's parties didn't start until the preacher and spouse left. I thought about sneaking out, but too many people wanted to welcome me. By the time I could get away, I ended up in the exit line. When I reached the front door, I wasn't sure what to say. Good sermon seemed weak for someone I'd spent so much time with, but I didn't get the chance to say anything. Cindy gave me another hug, and this time she kissed me on the cheek. We're having lunch with their lay leader and her husband, she said. It's a tradition for visiting pastors. Just pretend you like the place they take us, and I'll make it up to you later. I should have such problems all the time. They took us to Moshulu, a well-known place in Philadelphia. It was my first time there. The food was a bit fancy for my simple taste, but the view was amazing, and being with Cindy made everything fun. I had never met anyone so full of life. After lunch, she took me to the Franklin Institute, another place I had missed during my time in Pennsylvania. When I had to take her home, I realized I was hooked. Being with Cindy was like being around a big energy source. Her life was so vibrant that you couldn't help but feel energized, too. The next few months were full of that energy. I spent all my free time with her. We even went grocery shopping together. We met for coffee or breakfast before work, and I ate lunch with her whenever I could. After work, I'd go straight to her place or mine. We visited all the tourist spots the area had to offer. I especially loved the Washington Crossing State Park in Bucks County. I'm not sure why I had never seen that amazing painting of the event, but I could sit and look at it for hours. I know it's bad history. The crossing happened at night for crying out loud. Still, there's something in that painting that I think we've lost. Why is modern society more interested in a hero's flaws than in what makes them great? A culture is defined by its legends and heroes. I worry that by focusing on our hero's flaws, we miss the bigger picture. It's like studying the cracks in a brick and not seeing that it's part of the Jefferson Memorial. Seeing the sights with Cindy made me look at the bigger picture. 
Much of the focus at Washington Crossing Park now is on the lovely trails and the animals that live there. That's nice, especially for city folks. Still, doesn't it miss the point of why that park is there? A small group of men overcame terrible conditions and took great risks to keep fighting for freedom. Another reason I love that park is that it's where Cindy first became very close to me. It was late on a Saturday afternoon. We didn't do anything inappropriate in public. We were walking on one of the river trails when she suddenly wobbled and sat down on a bench. Concerned, I sat next to her and put my arm around her. Without a word, she snuggled into me. Cindy has a unique talent. When she snuggles, her body becomes soft and molds to mine. It felt like there were no barriers between us. This wasn't the first time we had snuggled, but this time, Cindy fell asleep within seconds. That's when I learned that Cindy has two speeds, full of energy and perfect rest. By letting me see her weakness, she was letting me understand how sick she was. She had taken that walk knowing she couldn't finish it and would need to rest. She knew I would understand, and I did. As I held her and looked at the river, my body was still, but my mind raced. I knew I had become obsessed with her. I woke up thinking about her, and she was my last thought when I fell asleep. But lately, my thoughts had been strange. For example, I had wondered last night if she was a saint. I don't mean just a good person, but someone like a young Mother Teresa. I didn't know much about saints, but I knew they were special, and I wasn't the only one who saw that Cindy was special. When I went to Children's Hospital with her, it was like she was a visiting rock star. People would stop what they were doing to talk to her. Not just children, but doctors and nurses, too. They would rush down the halls to exchange a few words with her. She had something special, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I felt the same pull, but even though I thought I was good at analyzing things, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand how she always made me feel like the center of her world. Even when she was deeply engaged in conversations with others, she was aware of me. Part of it was her constant eye contact, gauging my mood and comfort. Part of it was the little touches she gave me while talking to others. Still, given the attention she gave to others, it shouldn't have worked. Then there were the things people talked about in front of me. Children talked about living with terrible illnesses. Doctors and nurses talked about the stress of treating those kids and how it affected their private lives. I had no idea how emotionally hard it was for medical professionals to lose a child or how much they loved those children despite trying to stay professional. Some of them had never shared their deepest pain, even with their spouses, but they shared it with Cindy in public. I'll never forget the doctor who cried as he talked about cheating on his wife. There were three or four others around us when he started to open up and share his guilt. Everyone stood there with shock on their faces. I wondered how long it would take for this news to spread. He didn't care about that. He had to confess. Cindy didn't make it easy for him, though. She didn't yell, but she gave him a tough list of things to do to make up for what he'd done to his family. Amazingly, he thanked her, and anyone could see he felt lighter after the talk. As I sat on a bench holding Cindy the day before my 26th birthday, I knew I had a choice to make. If I didn't step back from Cindy soon... I never would. Lorelai had hurt me more than I thought possible without physical harm. But if I stayed with Cindy, I knew she would hurt me even more in a different way. Not by cheating. That was out of the question. No, it was because she was very sick, and I feared she might leave me forever. I thought maybe I should distance myself now so it wouldn't hurt as much if she died. Thinking about this, I held her even tighter. I couldn't stand the idea of losing her any sooner than I had to. I guess I held her too tightly because Cindy woke up a bit and snuggled closer. She whispered, Mmm, I love you. If leaving her had been an option before, it wasn't now. We hadn't talked about love before. She was still asleep and I felt tears in my eyes. I hadn't let myself admit I was falling in love with her. How could I have missed it? My feelings hit me hard. One of the strongest feelings was guilt, like I was being unfaithful to Lorelai. Then I felt rage over what Lorelai had done to me. Cindy stirred again, sensing my unease. I forced myself to calm down, not wanting to disturb her. Keeping her peace was more important than my anger. Only months later did I realize this meant more about my feelings than I knew at the time. All I knew then was that I couldn't leave her. The time for that had passed. Cindy's strength and fragility were now part of me. She relaxed again in my arms and I felt a warm feeling inside. 
She trusted me to protect her, and I would do my best to deserve that trust. But I also knew I couldn't save her from her illness. Before I could dwell on that sad thought, Cindy woke up. She stood up and pulled me to keep walking as she did before. I took her hand and gently pulled her back to me. We stood there, under the old trees by the river. The clouds floated in the blue sky. Cindy looked up at me with eyes that matched the sky, and I saw her soul. Cindy, I said, you're important to me. I never thought I'd let anyone get close to me again, but we need to talk about your health. I've had nightmares about finding you gone. I can't lose you without a fight. Temple University Hospital is one of the best for heart transplants. Cindy cut me off. I know, Chris, that's why I'm here. But you haven't let them give you the status you deserve. What status are you now? Four, five? Her eyes looked big and sad. I'm status seven. That's inactive. That has to change. I don't know how I'd handle losing you, but I can't be with you if you won't fight for us. How can I put my life ahead of others? Are they less loved? I see them at Temple, those who are waiting and scared. Cindy, this isn't up for debate. You aren't putting yourself first. The doctors are. They want to move you up the list. She looked at me, pleading. But Chris, what if their feelings for me affect their judgment? Cindy, what about children? Don't you want your children to know their mother? She broke down, hugging me and crying softly. We never talked about marriage or kids before, but I knew how much she wanted them. We met at a fertility clinic, after all. Her biological clock wasn't ticking. It was roaring. She whispered, I know it's wrong, but I want to leave a part of me behind. I talked to Sandy, begged her. She said she'd think about it. But Jim doesn't want more kids, and Sandy doesn't think she could carry a baby and then give it up. I hadn't met Sandy, Cindy's older sister, but I knew a lot about her. Sandy was 12 years older than Cindy, and Jim, her husband, was 47. They had two kids in high school. The idea of raising another child might not appeal to them, especially one that would still be in school when they were older, but it would be Cindy's child. I had a sudden realization. Cindy wasn't the only one who wanted to see her child born into this world. I didn't love her like I loved Lorelai. A part of me knew I could never love anyone as much as I'd loved Lorelai. She took a big part of my heart, and I couldn't get it back. But Cindy was the most important person in my life now. I also found her very attractive. No, we hadn't been intimate. She hadn't said anything, but it was clear she was saving that for marriage. I wasn't much for praying, but if I did, I'd thank God she followed a faith that had more flexible views about intimacy. After my divorce, I had no interest in sex. I never felt the need to be with someone just for fun. That changed when I met Cindy. She was a very appealing woman, and for the first time I felt a sort of closeness growing between us. Nodding to myself, I decided the world would be worse without a part of Cindy in it. I couldn't let that happen. I would love to practice having babies with Cindy, but I knew I wasn't ready to be a dad yet. I realized that even though I couldn't plan my future, at least I wasn't stuck in the past anymore. Before I met Cindy, I was always thinking about what I could have done to stop Lorelai from leaving. Or worse, I spent hours plotting revenge. As I held Cindy close, I realized Lorelai's poison was still there, but it was contained now. It hadn't taken over my whole being, and thanks to Cindy, it never would. I had no idea why she chose to be with me. I didn't know why she would love someone who was left broken by Lorelai. But if anyone could heal my soul, it was Cindy. It might not be the kind of love a man is supposed to feel for his wife, but it was close. I believed I could learn to love Cindy, maybe not as deeply as Lorelai, but it would be enough. I just needed time to heal. I needed time for her to work her magic on me. And I would do whatever it took to make sure she had the time to do it. We're going to Temple Hospital on Monday, Cindy. I'll do whatever I can to help you move up their list. I expected her to argue or maybe refuse, but instead she just looked into my eyes and said, Okay, Chris. Three weeks later, my boss called me into his office. I'm giving you a chance at the sales tech position. If you're interested, I'll break up our best team to train you. In a month or so, you'll join the team you'll work with. I'm making other changes too, so I can't tell you who your permanent partner will be. I swallowed hard and asked, If it doesn't work out, can I have my old job back? Sure, you'll have all your options open until the end of your training. If sales isn't for you, the training will still be great for your growth here. As I left the office, I felt nervous. 
My stomach was full of anxious butterflies. I'd read Death of a Salesman in college, and the idea of being like Willie Loman scared me. On my way home, I stopped by a bookstore and bought two joke books. When I tried reading them, I found most of the jokes were really old. Have you heard the one about the traveling salesman and the farmer's daughter? I didn't even smile until Cindy arrived. She had a key for emergencies, but always rang the bell. While I was making dinner, I heard her trying to hold back a laugh. Did you find one you haven't heard? I asked. One of the best things about Cindy was her laugh. She made me feel funny, even though I'm usually serious. Cindy wasn't silly, but she was happy, and she laughed even at my corniest jokes. I love this one, but it's too risky for you to use. There was this very clueless couple on their honeymoon. They tried everything, but they couldn't make it work. Finally, they stood on opposite sides of the room and ran at each other. The husband closed his eyes just before they crashed, and next thing he knew, he was falling naked off their balcony. He wasn't hurt, but he didn't know how to get back to his room through the crowded lobby. He saw a doorman and called him over. He didn't want to explain why he was naked, so he made up a story about being mugged and asked for towels. The doorman said, No problem, just go to your room. No one will see you. Everyone's on the second floor trying to get a naked lady off a doorknob. Cindy laughed hard. I think even my great-grandfather heard that joke in seventh grade, but I was surprised Cindy would tell it to me. As I mentioned before, we had some pretty intense moments, but she never let me touch her in a private way. I guess she could see what I was thinking. Chris, you've never asked me about my past. Remember what W. Bush said? When I was young and foolish, I was young and foolish. I was very foolish. I haven't talked about it, but now seems like the right time. If you want names and dates, I'll try my best, but it might take a while. I was surprised. I thought she was a virgin. I mean, she's a minister. As she sat there with her calm look, I felt really confused. I don't like the term, but it's what I was. I felt a wave of jealousy and knew that hearing the details would only make it worse. I also knew I needed to understand what made Cindy who she was. Then, before I could say anything, she answered the question I wanted to ask the most. I haven't been foolish since early in my senior year in college. I haven't even been tempted until you came into my life. But if I've learned anything, it's that it's never too late to stop being a fool. I know I'm not perfect, but I do the best I can. Chris, I liked doing what I did back then. It was only later that I felt a bit of regret. I wish I could come to you without any past mistakes, but I can't. She looked into my eyes, and it took me a few seconds to realize she was afraid this might change things for me. It did. I hadn't been sure that Cindy wasn't someone who thought sex was dirty or something to be done only in one way and in the dark. I guess that means you can teach me a thing or two. I tried to smile in a friendly way. For once, she didn't laugh. If I ever get married, I promise our wedding night will be amazing. An awkward silence followed. Awkward for me, I'm not sure Cindy noticed. Her words hit me. After she said, I love you, that Saturday, I had expected her to say, when we, and your head, but she said, if I, and my husband. I had no right to expect her to think about marriage. I wasn't even sure I wanted to marry her. What bothered me was that I wanted her to be ready for anything. With a bit of new understanding, I realized how much I wanted to be loved. I still hadn't told my parents where I was. Just before my divorce was final, I felt so lonely that I bought a cheap cell phone. When my dad answered, he yelled at me for not talking to my mom. Then he said something about needing to let Lorelai talk to me. I hung up just before I got sick. I knew my parents loved Lorelai more than me. She was more their child than I was. Hearing that from my dad hurt. I wrote an angry email, then waited until I calmed down. I revised it, toned it down, apologized for hanging up, but explained how even hearing her name affected me. I sent it using one of the company's fake email accounts. It had no return address, so no one could trace it. I think that's when my pain turned into anger. At least my anger made me feel like I didn't need them. I didn't need anyone. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. I'm not sure if you can die from loneliness physically, but you can for sure spiritually. Spending time with Cindy helped me recover. She saved me. I had been in a bad place, but she brought me back. Now, as I was healing, it felt like any other recovery. You have to deal with the pain. If your leg falls asleep, it tingles when the blood flows back. When your heart is cold, warming it up hurts too. Cindy, always kind, hugged me tight. 
Her embrace said so much. I wasn't alone, even if she wasn't saying I love you all the time. I was important to her, maybe even the most important person in her life. I wanted that, but I remembered something I heard long ago. If you want to be fully loved, you have to love in return. I kissed the top of her head, standing on my tiptoes to do it. Cindy is six feet tall, by the way. She looked up at me. I love you. It's okay if you don't love me yet. You're not ready. For now, it's enough that I love you. Don't worry, I'm not going to push you. I kissed her head again. I tried to say, I love you, but it wouldn't have been true. I didn't love her, but I knew she was the most important person in my life. Sadly, there were no other contenders. That night changed our relationship. Cindy didn't change much. She was maybe a bit more open with her affection. But I changed a lot. I relaxed more around her, even if not as much as with Lorelai. I was free to be myself. It was wonderful, and Cindy loved the real me even more than the mask I had shown her. Is it harder to trust than to love? I'm not sure. That didn't mean my other relationships were getting better. Two weeks after I started working with Call Me Bud, he asked for some technical facts during a presentation. He exaggerated the truth a lot. Then he turned to me and asked me to back him up. I gulped and did my best to support him. The customer didn't say anything, but stood up and walked out of the conference room. Call me Bud became, Mr. McKindley. You've just used your one get-out-of-jail-free card. I have serious doubts about your ability to do this job, and I'm not sure you should stay with the company. That was a setup. The customer knew what I was saying wasn't true. How long do you think it will take for him to trust you? If this had been real, how much would you have gotten for your honesty? Some sales jobs let you get away with lies, like telemarketing. Jobs where you never see or deal with the customer again. Some even pay well, but no real salesman would take one. The easy money is in the repeat sale. Real salespeople sell two things, the product and their personal promise. Sometimes just the product is enough, but with competition, that rarely lasts a whole career. It's my job to show all the good things we offer, but if I think our competitors have a better deal, I'll admit it. It's not just about honesty. Conditions change, and in a year or two, we might better meet their needs. We're in the security business, but a good manager will accept a less good deal if he trusts his vendor. I don't ever want to give that trust to a competitor. Take the rest of the day off and think about what I've said. I don't want you pointing out our weaknesses, but if I ever lie or exaggerate, I expect you to fix it, even if it costs us a sale. Think about it really hard. What kind of life do you want? You might not make as much money, but you'll sleep a lot better when you get to be my age. I didn't go home. Instead, I took a drive around the countryside of Bucks and neighboring counties. Seeing the old two- and three-century houses and the ones that looked old but were built recently, I thought about living in one of those fake heritage houses. Not just those that copy the style, but try to trick people into thinking they were built a long time ago. How would I explain caring so much to make the house look old? My life had been ruined, or at least changed a lot because of lies. Was that how the world worked? Or should I look for something better? Was honesty better? I knew I would be better off if others were honest, but would honesty be the best policy for me? I thought about Cindy. Would I be happier tricking her into being with me? Would there be a price to pay later on? What if I did fall in love with her? If she never found out, would anyone get hurt? I made up my mind and called Cindy to see where we were going to spend the evening, her place or mine. Children's Hospital said she'd gone home early because she wasn't feeling well. I called her cell and she didn't pick up. I called her home and there was no answer. A chill went down my spine and I started cursing the Pennsylvania highways. In Texas, I'd be able to drive 70 on state roads between towns. Here it was like driving on a city street, but without the stoplights. I couldn't even speed because there were too many cars on the road. When I got stuck at a light for the second time at some random intersection, I panicked and called 911. I explained that Cindy was at the top of Temple's transplant list and she wasn't answering her phone. I used some language I don't normally use and was almost begging for someone to check her apartment. They put me on hold and the operator told me they were sending a police car to check. I was still an hour from her apartment, and now stuck in rush hour traffic when 911 called me back and said her apartment was empty. A check of Temple showed no admission, and neither did the local emergency rooms. 
I can't describe what I felt then. I knew Cindy was my lifeline to normality and losing her was something I couldn't face without losing my mind. I forced myself to think. Was it possible she went to see a friend? Sure, but she had so many friends. Cindy knew over 3,000 people by their first name and considered each a close friend. She collected close friends like fences in West Texas collected tumbleweeds. Lost people found stability and roots in her just like I had. As I tried to get through traffic, losing more time with each shortcut, I began frantically calling her friends. I asked each one to help by calling others in a quick phone tree. It was almost seven when I reached her apartment. It was empty, and I broke down and cried. I hadn't cried since I held Lorelei right after her father died. Hope and fear battled in my chest when I heard a knock on her door. With tears still streaming down my face, I saw a policeman who'd been keeping an eye on the apartment. He was off-duty, but one of Cindy's friends. He assured me he'd contact me if he saw any sign of her and convinced me to wait at my place. I think it was partly fear that made me agree. I didn't want to hear the worst surrounded by the things she loved. Of course, she was waiting for me at my apartment, upset that I was late for her special dinner. She'd left her phone in her car and had no idea a citywide search was going on for her. At first, she thought it was sweet that I was worried about her. That was until I told her that I'd called her friends. Chris, those folks have enough problems of their own. They sure don't need to be worrying about me. As we started calling the folks I'd informed, people began showing up at the apartment. Time after time, I heard things like, Oh, Cindy, I was so scared. I can't imagine life without you, and I've never told you how much you mean to me. It was the most emotionally exhausting experience of my life. Yet it was also one of the most uplifting. The love from these friends was strong. Though it was directed at Cindy, their support helped heal my broken heart, too. By midnight, Cindy was totally worn out, and I put her to bed in my room. She managed to sleep even as people kept visiting until almost three in the morning, which showed how weak she was. Some of the last arrivals asked if they could stay until she woke up, and I just couldn't ask them to leave. Cindy didn't move when I gently touched her cheek before settling into my gamer's chair for some surprisingly restful sleep. She was still asleep at seven the next morning when I came out to find my living room full of people I didn't know. Someone handed me a cup of coffee, and I called Mr. McKindley to let him know I'd be coming in late. I had a bad scare last night. I thought something had happened to Cindy. I panicked and got a lot of people worried. I paused for a moment and then said, I thought about what you told me, especially last night. I wondered what Cindy would think if she saw me like that, and it made me see things differently. I decided I never want her to think less of me if I can help it. There was a long silence before he replied, She's something special. Let's not bring this up again. Stay in today and look after her. Tomorrow we'll start your real training. A few minutes later, Cindy walked out of my bedroom, looked at the group of people in my apartment, and joked with a big grin, Chris, now that all these friends know I stayed the night with you, what will you do to fix my reputation? Everyone laughed, but people only left when new visitors arrived. Cindy handled everything with grace and composure. I'm not sure how Queen Elizabeth manages her crowds, but Cindy could teach her a thing or two. Despite being tired, Cindy reassured each of the hundreds of people who came by that they would be among the first she called if she ever needed anything. Someone, actually several someones, brought in so much food that it reminded me of when my great aunt passed away. Her neighbors had filled her small house with food, and I hadn't known people in big cities did that too. I don't know how much food was brought, but by the time the last person left, there wasn't even a cracker left to eat. Me? I felt like I did when we won our first national championship with a goal in the last minute. Not just tired, but on an emotional high. With so many people showing their love for Cindy and with her response, it was clear to me that I was the one she really loved. Her bishop told me as he left, She may not be the greatest treasure, but she is a treasure beyond value. Take good care of her. The next three months, until she got her heart, were a nightmare. At the time, I was so caught up in everything that I didn't notice the important changes happening in Cindy and me. I thought that once Cindy's condition worsened, she'd be given a higher priority for a transplant. But she wasn't. She was a lower priority, and finding a match for her was tough. 
I don't know how the people who decide who gets a heart make their choices, but it's probably best that I don't know. I'm a fan of the United Network of Organ Sharing now, but I wasn't until Cindy got her heart. The first time I heard that someone else got a heart that could have gone to Cindy, I was furious. The man who got the heart was in his forties, married with two kids, and he was sicker than Cindy, bedridden. But I couldn't understand why they picked him over her. Cindy wasn't bothered, which just made it harder for me. By the time the next heart was available, Cindy was showing signs of failure. She had to give up one of her classes and cut back to part-time at the hospital. It was the first time I saw her cry over her condition. Not for herself, but for the kids she couldn't help anymore. A week later, her body started swelling up and she looked nothing like the woman I loved. That's when I realized how deeply I loved her. I took her to the hospital that night with tears of anger and sadness in my eyes. Cindy was so weak and struggling to breathe, yet she still wasn't next on the list for a heart. Instead, a wealthier woman with a big donation to the hospital was. To be fair, the woman was only a few years older than Cindy and had two young children and a loving husband. Cindy had been in the hospital for a month. She was too weak for a transplant when the last heart was available. One night, as I saw how weak Cindy looked in her bed, I had a dark thought. I wondered if it was possible for me to kill someone. If it was anyone but Cindy, I might have done it. God might forgive me. Cindy might forgive me. But she would never stay with me. And I couldn't face that. During this time, Cindy's friends were always there. The hospital had to set limits on how many visitors she could have each day. The list of people who wanted to see her was very long. Only her family and I could visit her every day. I should probably tell you about when I met her parents. It was right after she went into the hospital. Cindy put her parents as her emergency contacts, not knowing the hospital would call them. She was shocked when they showed up. I had never met a girlfriend's parents before. I was at the nurse's station when this older couple came up to me. The man, who was 65, held out his hand and said, I'm Steve, Cindy's dad. I've been looking forward to meeting the man who means so much to my little angel. Before I could reply, his wife hugged me and whispered, Cindy didn't want us to meet you yet. She didn't think you were ready for that kind of thing. But we had to come. I blinked hard. Even with everything going on, Cindy was thinking about my feelings before her parents. I realized in that moment that I loved her. I wasn't ready for marriage, but I loved her. I met her older sister and her family the next day. I saw where Cindy got her kind nature. They accepted me like I was part of the family and listened to my opinions about Cindy's care. They treated me like I was her husband, and it made me think about becoming that. When we were alone, I brought up getting married. Cindy cried but shook her head. Oh, Chris, I want you as my husband more than anything. I love you so much, but I won't get married like this. There's too much drama. Her hands were puffy and cold. She pulled my hands to her cheek. I want you to be the father of my children, but it's too important to decide now. If it's God's will and I come home, we can talk then. My sister Sandy might think about carrying one of my babies, but I don't want you to feel like you have to be the dad if I'm not here. Promise me you won't decide out of obligation or emotion. I couldn't say anything. I had already decided I would do anything to have children with Cindy. I had daydreamed about being a single father and saw myself as a noble figure. At the time, I was upset that Cindy didn't want me to do this noble thing. Now, I shudder at how hard it would be to handle a newborn alone. Cindy always seemed to understand me perfectly. Don't worry, she said. If I go, I know it's not my time yet. But I won't hold you to any promises made now. Facing death doesn't scare me, but it has made me see things clearly. I want you, Chris, but I need you to be ready. When I get you, I want all of you. Our marriage will need complete commitment. It won't work if you don't give everything. Years later, I realized how true her words were. My heart was damaged too, beyond repair. Cindy had a way of seeing into my soul that no one else did. I loved her, but her understanding of me was almost supernatural. I'll never forget the night we got the call about a heart. I was in her room, getting ready to leave, when a doctor burst in. We have a match in New York. The heart will be here in about an hour and we need to start getting you ready. The team's on their way. If you need to call anyone, do it now, Cindy asked softly. Do we know anything about my donor? The doctor hesitated. A student at NYU. She got shot in the head during a robbery. 
She was declared brain dead 20 minutes ago. She had a donor card and her family insisted on donating her organs. I tried to stay calm, but I was nervous. For some reason, patients are more likely to reject a heart from a female donor than a male. It wasn't a big deal, but I wished it had been a male student. I didn't really care much about the donor at that moment. Cindy looked kind and asked, Will I be able to contact them? I want to share their pain and thank them for this gift. Uh, we don't encourage contact between donor and recipient. It's a very hard time and I'm going to write a note, Chris. Make sure the family gets it, okay? While Cindy wrote her note, I called her mom and the two people I needed to for the official Cindy support team. After waiting so long, everything started moving fast. In just over an hour, they were ready to take Cindy out of her room. I panicked. The thought that this might be the last time I saw her alive hit me hard. I felt weak and sat in the chair beside her bed, holding her hand tightly. Cindy was calm. Her bishop was coming to a special waiting room. Everyone bowed their heads while he said a prayer, even some of the surgeons. Only Cindy's parents, the nurses, and I were in the room. Cindy asked for a moment alone with me. The nurses looked hesitant but left. Her parents kissed her, said they loved her, and left with tears in their eyes. Cindy squeezed my hand and sat up a bit. Chris, I'm okay with whatever happens. My worry is about you. If I don't make it, I know where I'll be. But you're not ready to be alone again yet. Promise me, if I don't wake up, you'll spend time with your family. You haven't given them a fair chance. I didn't push you because your pain is deep. But if I'm not here, let them help you. They will help you. I felt pain in my voice when I said, they chose her side. You don't know that. All you know is your dad got angry because he was hurt. That's a natural reaction. When someone hurts you or someone you love, you get mad too. It's not always bad. Give them a chance. They want to reach out to you. They'll come in a flash if you let them. You've talked to them? I was shocked and angry. Cindy just smiled that calm smile, which made me even angrier. She never fought with me. She either agreed or made me see I needed to apologize. It drove me crazy. Once I asked why she never reacted like most people when they get mad. She gently said, When I decided to become a minister, I was upset. I wasn't living like a minister and didn't want to. I was hot-tempered too. God promised me peace if I followed this path. He's kept his promise even if I haven't always kept mine. If something happened to you, I couldn't bear our last talk being a fight. That was on my mind, but I was determined. I didn't want my parents to find me. Cindy, you know. I used a disposable cell phone and no, they don't know where you are. I've talked to them but never told them where you are. They hired detectives to find you. Talking to me has actually given you more time. She paused and looked hurt. Was I wrong? Chris, we all love you. Please don't be mad at me. I broke down. My God, Cindy, how could I be mad at you for doing what you think is right? I'll see them, but promise me you'll go with me. I don't want to be alone with them. She smiled. What kind of girl do you think I am? I've been waiting to meet your parents. I've even picked out a dress. A nurse popped her head in. We can't wait any longer. He can walk with you to the operating room if you'd like. We didn't talk as they wheeled her down the hall and into an open elevator. I just held her hand. It wasn't until later that I noticed Cindy wasn't scared when they opened the doors to the operating room. I couldn't go in, but I saw the sterile, cold room from the hallway. Before they took her in, Cindy pulled me close and kissed me. It wasn't a goodbye kiss. It was a passionate kiss. The next time you see me, I'll have tubes everywhere and look awful. Think of this kiss as a preview for when I'm better. I love you, Chris. With a healthy heart, I'll love you even more. I love you too. Marry me? I asked suddenly. Cindy smiled brightly. Of course. Who could resist a proposal in such romantic surroundings? Look at my goosebumps. Her humor made me laugh despite the chill. She winked at me as they wheeled her into the operating room and the doors closed behind her. I shivered, feeling the cold. A nurse led me away. And it wasn't until I saw Cindy's family that the reality of what I'd said hit me. I'd asked her to marry me, and she had said yes. I realized she knew it wasn't just the drama of the transplant. She was the woman I wanted to spend my life with. The woman I wanted to have children with and grow old with. Knowing I might lose her made me see how special she was. 
Most of us don't expect to make a mark on history or change the world, but Cindy could. If she lived long enough, she would be someone kids read about in school. Having someone as amazing as Cindy love me was incredible. It might be enough to make up for everything else. I didn't have as much to offer her, but she saw something in me. These thoughts filled my mind until I was surprised to see I'd been in the waiting room for an hour when Sandy, Cindy's sister, offered me a cup of coffee. I'd ask for your thoughts, but they seem valuable, and your smile suggests they might make me blush. My sister is special, and I almost lost hope she'd find her true love. I raised an eyebrow and she continued, The unmet love of my life. She said she was waiting for him. She stopped using that term after she met you. I took a sip of the coffee. It was sweet and creamy, just how I liked it. Cindy must have told her. Cindy drank her coffee black and always teased me about it, but she had told her sister about my preference. On a whim, I blurted, Cindy told me she had a wild side, but I can't see her that way. You want to hear about Cindy's past? She asked me to tell you about her wild years. She's worried you might think she's perfect. She doesn't see herself the way we do, and that's what makes her special. I smiled. I've never been around ministers, and I'm not sure I could meet that standard. But I do want to know more about her past. Not the details, just what her family saw. We weren't a very religious family. We missed church as often as we went. Cindy was a typical high school girl, more popular than most. She was voted most friendly in her class, but didn't date much. In college, she changed. By her second year, she was a party girl. I don't know how many guys she dated, but she was obvious about it, even bringing them home. It caused fights, but she had a full academic scholarship and told our parents she'd stay away if they objected. Toward the end of her second year, she went to a Christian event and came back saying she'd given her life to Jesus. We were skeptical. She stopped using drugs, but lived with three more guys before finishing college. When she said she was going to seminary school, we were shocked. I asked why, and she said she'd known since that event. She said changing takes time, even with faith. Many Christians expect instant change, but she believed it was a lifelong process. She thinks being born again often means keeping the same struggles, but changing your desires and goals. She believes it's about making new friends who support your values. She says it didn't take as long as Paul's conversion, but it's still a journey. That's why people are drawn to her. She understands struggle and failure and stays with people as long as they don't give up. I once asked her how she gave up her old habits. She looked me straight in the eye and said, The love of Jesus and a good friend. I know we've talked about that before, but I wanted you to know I don't think you need to worry about Cindy. I can't believe I'm talking about Cindy's private life, especially right now. But like I said, this is something she wanted you to know and couldn't tell you herself. Cindy hardly ever feels ashamed about things, but her wild days do sometimes bother her. If you ask me, she knew she wanted to work in the ministry for a long time and tried to resist the idea. In the end, she accepted it, and I think her past helps her understand the rest of us better than many ministers. Time never stops, and no matter how slow it feels, it keeps moving. Every so often, someone would come in to give us an update. They were always so cheerful it made my skin crawl. I spent time with her parents, looked through technical manuals, and stared at the clock. Several times I tried counting seconds to see how close I could get to the minute changing. There was a long wait without any news. Then a doctor came out and told us they were going to try a different type of transplant. They said not to worry, that Cindy was very strong and doing fine. I had learned a lot about heart transplants from the information Temple provided and what I found online. This just made me more aware of what could go wrong. After what felt like ages, her surgeon came out and told us Cindy was in recovery and we could see her one at a time. She's doing better than any patient I can remember. We still have some big hurdles, but the fit was almost perfect. I went first. It never occurred to me that her family should go before me. I put on a gown and wasn't allowed to touch her but could watch her. She didn't look like patients in the movies. I think actors are too proud to let themselves look this bad. Cindy had been through the toughest fight of her life, and she showed it. Her thick hair had been cut short a month ago to make it easier in the hospital, but now it was matted and messy. Her face was puffy from fluid retention. Her skin had been covered in that orange stuff they use to fight infection. She lay on the bed, and a nurse was pressing on a bandage near her leg. 
They must have opened a big artery for some reason. I noticed all this with my side vision. My eyes locked on the long scar on her chest. Her breasts looked bruised, and I was worried about the puckered skin at the top of the cut and the tube sticking out below it. She looked worse than I'd ever seen, but also more beautiful. She had a tube in her mouth, but was breathing. She was alive. Unlike at a funeral where people say someone looks like they're sleeping, but they only look dead, Cindy was clearly alive. I didn't realize I was crying until a tear ran across my lips. I wasn't sure why I was crying, but I felt like the day had gotten brighter. I knew we would face many challenges in the coming months, but we'd face them together. They let her go from the hospital ten days later, which I thought was too soon. I drove her to her apartment, where her mother would take care of her. She held a small heart-shaped pillow to her chest to ease the bone pain from every tiny movement. How could they release someone who moaned every time I hit a bump? But they did get some things right. We'd had lots of warnings and counseling sessions. Depression often follows open-heart surgery, especially for transplant patients. Many aren't ready for it. Temple had a great program, teaching us what to look for and expect. One of the hidden problems was that the medication for chest pain could hide the depression. They also warned us about the fear factor. Her chest would hurt because her sternum had been cut. It would be hard for her to tell if the pain was from the surgery or her old heart problems. They strongly recommended she not be left alone for at least four weeks. She would go to the clinic once or twice a week for the first month and then weekly, until eventually it would be every other month. Plus, she needed people around her, as if finding people to be with Cindy would be a problem. It was the opposite. There were many other things, but the main point was that while life would never be normal again, she would live. The good news was that about 50% of heart transplant patients live for at least 10 years. One had made it past 25 years. It's funny how staring at death for so long messes with your sense of time. I don't mean to sound down, but it's sad knowing we might not celebrate her 50th birthday. Instead, it's better to enjoy planning her big 30th birthday party. A bit more than four months after Cindy got her new heart, we took a plane to Austin. She had been talking to my parents, and she was so calm about the trip, but it made me super nervous. They told me I wouldn't see Lorelai or hear her name, but how could I not think about her? Lorelai lived with her mom, only a block away from my parents' house. I had never asked directly, but Cindy talked openly with my parents from the time she got home. After her first call, Cindy asked if I wanted to know how my ex was doing, and I almost had a panic attack. Once I asked Cindy to marry me, Lorelai's name didn't bother me much anymore. Still, hearing about her new life, or worse, seeing her, was too much. Cindy promised I wouldn't have to see Lorelai when we planned the trip. Some guys want to keep up with their ex-wives, but that wasn't me. Thinking about seeing Lorelai felt like opening a door filled with gray fog, like in a scary movie. My mind shouted, Here live dragons! Even thinking about talking to her made me fidget, and if I dwelled on it, I'd start sweating. If it meant I had issues, fine. As long as I wasn't forced through that door, I was happy. I was normal, and I loved Cindy. Helping to take care of her cured me. Bringing her bedpans and helping with physical therapy showed me her worst. I even heard her curse the first time she sat in the tub against doctor's orders and couldn't get up. I cleaned her mouth when the drugs made her too sick to hold her head up. I saw her at her emotional lowest, in pain and short-tempered, and loopy from OxyContin. OxyContin is a great drug, but I hope I never have to take it. It made Cindy unnaturally happy and think she could do things she couldn't. I'll never forget finding her trying to flip the mattress in the guest room. When I scolded her, she wasn't as sorry as she should have been. Another effect of the meds. I thanked God when she could switch to milder pain meds. I never thought much about it. But pain has a purpose. Pain stops us from hurting ourselves. You don't stir boiling water with your hand because it hurts. Cindy felt so little pain that she wanted to go back to work part-time. She always wanted to help people, but... Well, if you've been around someone really sick, you know the stories. It's actually easier to think about those times than what happened in Austin. I insisted my folks not meet us at the airport. I rented a nice car and got us a double room at the Red Roof Inn in Round Rock. It used to be a Hyatt, so I knew the rooms would be fine. It was ten miles north of my parents' place so I thought we'd avoid running into old friends. Cindy didn't mind us sharing a room. 
It wasn't about money. It's just that she still shouldn't be alone. We often slept in the same bed, but we didn't do anything else. You want to know a simple view of hell? Try that with a woman you love. We flew to Austin to tell my folks about our wedding and to invite them in person. I fought the trip hard, but I knew we had to do it. Maybe we all still want our parents' approval. I didn't care what they thought of my divorce, but I wanted them to approve of Cindy. We wanted a small church wedding, and I wanted them there. As I waited in the lobby for Cindy to freshen up, whatever that means, I was really tense. The flight was rough. We left Philly at 6.30 a.m. on Delta, changed planes in Cincinnati of all places, and got to Austin at 10.50, just 15 minutes late. Our plane picked the farthest gate at Bergstrom Airport, so we walked forever to get to the baggage area and car rental. I tried to get Cindy to ride one of those courtesy carts, but she refused. By the time we fought through traffic and construction on I-35, it was almost noon. I've heard that I-35 has been under construction since it was built in 1965. I don't know if that's true, but it's been under construction my whole life. Between the construction and the fast-driving Texas drivers, I felt frazzled when I arrived. Our lunch meeting was set for one o'clock at La Margarita, a restaurant a short drive from our hotel, known for having some of the best Mexican food around. But I was worried we might be late. Honestly, I was more nervous about how this meeting would go. Being late didn't really bother me. To be truthful, I didn't want to go at all. I felt Cindy was too tired from traveling to meet her future in-laws. Cindy, though, was her usual calm self. Sure, she might have been a bit nervous. She even asked me to leave our room because she said I was hovering over her. That wasn't true. I was at least a foot away from her most of the time. When she walked into the lobby, I couldn't help but stare. It wasn't just her looks, though she was pretty in her own way. She had this presence that lit up the room. It's hard to explain, but she made everything seem better no matter what. Because she looked so confident, my worries seemed small. I held out my arm like in old movies and escorted her to the car. At the restaurant, the lunch crowd from the nearby Dell office was leaving, so parking was easy. The smell of good Mexican food greeted us as soon as we walked in. With all the Mexican immigrants, you'd think you could find good Mexican food anywhere. But outside the border states, it's tough. California has decent Mexican food, but it doesn't compare to Tex-Mex. They say smell brings back the strongest memories, and the scent in La Margarita reminded me I hadn't eaten since my untouched meal on the plane. My parents were already waiting when we got there. I stiffened up when I saw them, but Cindy slipped out of my arm and hugged my dad and then my mom. Anyone watching would think we were married for years and saw each other often. I felt a bit choked up at how easily they accepted her. Mom hugged me hard and she seemed to have the same allergies I did. Even Dad had watery eyes. I know mine were. Cindy saved the day by having tissues in her purse. We all used them before even saying hello. My voice was hoarse from my allergies when I introduced her. Mom, Dad, this is Cindy. She wanted to meet you before we got married. Cindy jumped in, saying how happy she was to meet them, and somehow just talking to her made our allergies better. Cindy had a talent for making people feel at ease. As we sat down, the conversation flowed easily, just like we did this all the time. Lunch was great. The food always is at La Margarita, but I can't even remember what I ordered or ate. Cindy smoothed over any awkwardness, and by the time lunch ended, none of us wanted to leave. Cindy suggested Dad show her around Austin. So we piled into their car to see the sights of the state capitol and the LBJ library. We also visited the French Legation and the Bob Bullock Texas History Museum. I hadn't been there, and if you're in Austin, you must check out the Texas Spirit Theater. It's amazing. By the end of our tour, Cindy was worn out. I had them take us back to our car. Cindy fell asleep on my shoulder, and I noticed a worried look on Dad's face in the rearview mirror. Mom turned back and mouthed, Is she okay? I nodded, and Cindy woke up right as we got off the expressway. She saw the Fuddruckers across from our hotel. Smiling, she said, Chris is always talking about Texas barbecue and Fuddruckers burgers. He even joked about driving up to Bethlehem to get one. Can we meet you for dinner there tonight? I need a nap, but say in two hours. Mom took on her motherly role. Sweetheart, are you sure? It's been a long day. Are you supposed to eat a burger? Cindy smiled, ready for one of her few soapbox moments. I love beef and it's good for you. 
The largest study by the National Institute of Health found no link between eating fat and high cholesterol. The real worry with high-fat diets is calories. I watch my weight, but a burger once in a while is fine. Dad had recently bought a small ranch in the hill country, about 320 acres, and the nearest place to buy milk was a 20-minute drive. He often wore shirts with funny quotes like, Vegetarian, a Native American word for bad hunter. One evening I helped Cindy back to our room. She was very tired. As she slept, I sat at the little desk making sure she was okay. I knew I was being silly, but I worried about her. When Cindy did too much, she would suddenly fall down like a top that stopped spinning. I'm not sure how it started, but at dinner we suddenly began talking about our wedding. Cindy asked my mom to help plan it, and they became best friends over it. She even invited mom to come to Philly to shop for her wedding dress. Then, Cindy surprised me by saying her best friend from seminary, now a chaplain, suggested that we consider having our wedding at a chapel at Southwestern University. She asked mom if they could go see it the next day. This was news to me, so I blurted out, What about your friends in Philly? Cindy smiled and gently patted my arm. She said, That's the problem. If we have the wedding in Philly, we can't have a small one. Ever since we announced we were getting married, I've been flooded with invitations for bridal showers. We can't invite everyone without hurting feelings. I thought about Roaring Springs, but my home church there is too small. If we get married here, it would make sense but I'd have to explain why we didn't invite anyone from PA except family. I know it would be a burden on you, but... Mom interrupted. Of course, I'd be happy to help, but I know you have your own ideas about what you want. Cindy said, I would love a small wedding in a country church, but since most of the guests will be your family and friends, I trust your judgment. Mom's willingness to help made Cindy feel loved. That trip, we only had one awkward moment. We were at home, Relaxing in the living room after dinner, Mom and Cindy were discussing wine in an open bar at the wedding reception. Mom was surprised to learn that Cindy drank wine and mixed drinks. My family always enjoyed wine with dinner, and Dad liked a beer in the evening. Then Mom said, Of course I had to give it all up when I got pregnant, but it was worth it. I loved being pregnant. You'll see, it's the most wonderful. What? Suddenly there was tension. Mom, Cindy can't get pregnant. Her heart might handle it, but the drugs could harm the baby. There is some debate about transplant patients having babies. After some research, we decided it was too risky. Cindy had her tubes tied. It wasn't safe for the baby due to the medications. Cindy continued, I want Chris's baby so much it makes me cry. We met at a fertility clinic, but it doesn't look good. We hope my sister will agree to carry our baby, but she's getting older. I was trying not to lose my temper. My dad looked confused and mom had tears in her eyes. She said, I had to have a full hysterectomy right after Chris was born. I never knew that, and I always wondered why I was an only child. My anger faded quickly and I was speechless. As always, Cindy knew how to ease the tension. We'll trust God to provide a way, she said. I don't know if it was God's will, but we got married two months later in the Southwestern Chapel. It was a beautiful wedding. Everyone cried, danced, and only a few of my old friends got too drunk. People mentioned Lorelei a few times, but it didn't bother me. It was a great day. The night was even better. If I ever had doubts about life with Cindy, they vanished completely. We bought a house in Hatboro and settled down. Was it boring? No, it was heaven. Cindy knew how to have fun. She made everyone around her happy. Cindy went to Philadelphia on Tuesdays and Thursdays to teach at a Lutheran school. She also worked as a chaplain at hospitals and filled in for other ministers on Sundays. I was doing well in sales. If Cindy had a different job, I might have insisted she stay home. Life changed on our first anniversary. We didn't have a party. Instead, we went to a little country inn and barely left our room. Cindy taught me that love brought many gifts, including the joy of being together. When we got home, we found a surprise from Sandy. It was just a simple appointment card for a fertility clinic. I don't know how much you know about in vitro, but it's like a miracle. The day I met Cindy, she had her eggs collected. Back then, it was a small surgery, but new technology with ultrasound makes it easier now and reduces the need for fertility drugs. In simpler terms, the egg and around 75,000 active sperm cells are combined in the lab, and the embryo is placed in the womb about three days later. 
This process is very costly, and usually several eggs are prepared at once because the implantation is quite straightforward. For us, we ended up with four embryos. Two of those were placed in Sandy, but in most cases, only one survives. From a personal view, my part was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life, but I would do it a million times for our kids. Cindy had already done her part, but I had to go into a small room by myself to provide a sample. We had to abstain for five days before to ensure a good sample. Knowing everyone was waiting outside for me was not how I imagined creating children. We were also there when the embryos were placed in Sandy, but her husband Jim was not. I'm not sure if that was the right choice, but it might have been smart. I never thought about how hard it could be for Jim, having his wife carry not just another man's child, but her sister's egg. Jim is a great guy, but he didn't want me around Sandy while she was pregnant. Cindy, on the other hand, was there all the time. She helped Sandy with her morning sickness and later massaged her back. After the twins were born, Jim talked to me about how hard it was to not get attached to the babies. It was even harder for Sandy. There's a saying, Can a mother forget the child in her womb? I didn't understand until later what an act of selfless love Sandy, Jim, and their children provided. I wasn't in the delivery room with Sandy. I was in the waiting room with Jim. Cindy was with her sister when she gave birth to our daughter, Sandy Grace, and our son, James Kylan, and held both before her sister did. Now everyone knows newborns aren't the cutest, but I'm not exaggerating when I say ours were beautiful. They weren't just good-looking newborns, they were stunning. When the nurse put them in my arms, I shook with emotions. Cindy had to quickly take them because I was shaking so much. They were part of me, so tiny, so helpless, and so beautiful they took my breath away. My heart was so full of love for them. I wanted to make the world a better place for them and marvel at their perfection. Men usually make a fuss about changing dirty diapers. I can't say I loved it, but I didn't mind. After seeing what it took to create those two wonderful miracles, I was in awe of the process. One good thing about Cindy not having to carry our children was that she had more energy than most mothers of newborns. It wasn't a huge difference, but Cindy's bit of energy felt like it could power a whole city. Maybe not all of it, but enough for her to keep surprising me with her love. How she could be so loving and so lively at the same time made Cindy special. The next two years flew by. I never knew life could be so full. Cindy might have been a minister, but even with two babies at home, she was far from dull. Her energy and joy made every day amazing. And who would have thought I could have so much fun at church events? Cindy loved being with the twins, but still found time to write. She also filled in on Sundays for ministers who couldn't be there. Cindy never repeated her sermons, and it was inspiring to listen to her preach. Plus, it was nice that the visiting minister often got taken to lunch at the best restaurant around. It wasn't much pay, but it introduced us to great places to eat. It's funny, I got promoted to area technical sales manager with great pay, so I traveled and ate out a lot. Even though I loved Cindy's cooking, I also loved dining out with her. She was so interesting. I'm a smart guy, but Cindy amazed me. She studied scripture in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. She read the great philosophers and wrote to many current thinkers. Yet, when we'd have lunch with people who didn't finish high school, she could make her points in ways they understood. I used to be a bit of a snob about being smart, but spending time with various church folks changed me. I learned more from real-life experiences than from any classroom. Life wasn't perfect. We had our problems. One was that our house was always full of people. Cindy loved having guests. It drove me crazy for a while, then I lost my temper. Cindy's response was calm. Why didn't you say something? I'll handle it. And somehow she did. She still had lots of friends, but our home was quieter after that. A new problem started recently. Cindy began talking about our other children. She was getting healthier and wanted to have the last two embryos implanted. This scared me a lot. She was a great patient. Her new heart was almost a perfect match, but she still needed to take her medicine to stay healthy. She felt really good, better than before she went to Africa. This made our arguments even bigger. I'd yell and wave my hands. She would smile calmly and talk reasonably. Her main point was that the embryos were human and shouldn't be left frozen. We argued about when life begins. She said, why risk it, even if we weren't sure? 
I was raised to believe in a woman's right to choose, but agreed that a baby should be protected once it could survive outside the mother, probably in the last trimester. In one argument, I mentioned that some religious views supported abortion to protect the mother's health. Cindy, who had studied religion deeply and wrote books on it, out-argued me easily. Her real reason for wanting the embryos was emotional. She saw them as her babies and couldn't stand leaving them frozen. One Sunday, I sat her down and said, Honey, I will never allow you to carry those babies. You always said I was the head of this family and I'm making this final. Cindy smiled and said, Then if I find someone else to carry them, we'll have two more babies? I felt tricked. She used the moment to distract me and I agreed without thinking. Two months later, Cindy had big news. She wore a nice outfit, made my favorite dinner, and told me she signed a contract to write seven books over the next ten years. This would make her lots of money working part-time from home. She asked me to take the twins to a friend's house while she cleaned up so we could discuss our future. I agreed happily. When I got back, Cindy had prepared something special for me. She wore a nice outfit and had candles lit around the room. But when I entered, I realized her sweet smile wasn't just for me. It was for someone she loved even more. Even before I touched her, I knew she would never smile at me like that again. She must have died just minutes after I left because she was already so cold. I pulled the covers from her side of the bed to try and warm her. A strange thought hit me. How could she have smiled if she was having a heart attack? Then I fell to the floor and cried. I don't know how long I cried, but after what felt like forever, I sensed her voice saying, Chris, don't cry for me. You know where I am. Don't try to be strong alone. Let your friends help. The twins need you. I didn't actually hear her voice. It was more like a warm feeling washed over me, telling me what she wanted. I don't believe in ghosts, but I felt like her spirit was with me. My pain didn't go away, but no one will ever make me believe that Cindy left without saying goodbye. Somehow, I managed to call 911. I even helped the paramedics move her onto their cart. They knew her from her volunteer work at our local hospital. One of them had tears in her eyes. I think that helped me. I knew that paramedics usually stay calm and professional, but I also knew this crew wouldn't treat Cindy's body like just another case. The police showed up too, and one of them was Cindy's friend. I knew they had to ask questions, but it felt more like a friend sharing in my grief. I don't remember who called the couple looking after the twins or who reached out to Cindy's parents, Sandy, and my parents. I think I was in shock. I couldn't go back into our bedroom, so I went to my chair in the den. Someone put some soft elevator music on our CD player, and people started to fill the den. They were clergy and friends. Someone might have spoken to me, but I don't think they did. I remembered when Cindy had me read the book of Job. She pointed out how Job's friends sat in silence with him for a long time before offering any advice. Sitting in my chair, I realized that sometimes silence is the best support one can offer. I didn't sit there for seven days, but I didn't sleep that night. In the morning, my body's needs made me get up, and it was then that I realized two things. First, Cindy had great friends. Over 12,000 people signed her register. The largest Methodist church in Philly was full, and people stood outside in the grounds. The road was lined with people as we took her to the cemetery. But second, I realized I didn't have any close friends of my own. I had many people I liked and who liked me, but no one who would sit with me through such hard times. No, that's not true. There was one person closer to me than any sibling. Deep in my grief, I still felt hurt that because of what Lorelai had done, she wasn't there for me. By her actions, I lost not just my wife, but my best friend, too. She had left me alone, and that pain was almost too much to bear. There's no need to describe all that goes into burying a spouse. If you've done it, you understand. If you haven't, there's no way to explain how it feels to know part of you is in that box in the ground. Watching a machine shovel dirt on your loved one is incredibly hard. It was a mistake to stay alone with her at the end. I felt I needed to be there, to tuck her in one last time like I did when she was in the hospital. But there was no grand sign from God. Just a breeze and the sweet scent of the flowers people brought. That scent was enough. She loved fresh flowers. About a month later, I was opening the usual condolence cards when I saw it. I didn't need to open it to know it was a birthday card from Lorelai. It had no return address, and my address was typed. 
Inside, there was a beautiful card and an appointment card for a fertility clinic, just like the one I found the night Cindy died. Tomorrow is my birthday and I am scared. I have a big decision to make and I don't know what to do. Please tell me, what would you do? Because I looked at the clock, I know I had lived 12,656,620 minutes when it happened. Don't you think it should take more than 27 minutes to ruin everything it took that long to build? It never seemed right or even possible that so much damage could occur in such a short time or that there was nothing good in those few moments. In less time than it takes to watch a short TV show, I changed the lives of people I will never meet. So many lives. 27 minutes is how long it took Professor Jacob Ethan Riley King to mess up my life and turn my world upside down. To understand how it happened, you need to know who I am. To understand that, you need to know Chris, my ex-husband. Our parents were best friends before we were born, and we spent more time together than most siblings. We spent so much time together that we developed a special bond, like some twins do. I had no secrets from Chris, and he had none from me. We always knew what the other was thinking, and often finished each other's sentences. We were so close, like many twins, that we didn't feel the need for personal space like other people. Teachers often told us to stand farther apart. I think that's one reason Professor King targeted me. It wasn't because I was some great beauty. I have a decent figure if you like athletic women. My face might have been nice, but I had a large brown birthmark on my right cheek. Most kids with these birthmarks are teased a lot, but I was not because Chris always made sure no one picked on me. I don't remember the first time Chris fought because someone made fun of me, but I do remember the last time. We were freshmen in high school, and it nearly got Chris killed. The biggest jock in our school was a senior. He wasn't just strong and athletic. He was the biggest, fastest, and meanest linebacker in Texas. I'm not exaggerating. He played in several NFL Pro Bowls. He probably had someone on his staff read his news clippings to him because he graduated from OU. So what can you expect? Chris and I were both athletes. The first time I met this guy, we'll call him Rock, I was in the weight room. Rock came in after football practice and started making fun of my birthmark. I've been known to have a sharp tongue and I was verbally cutting him down, but he was too dumb to notice. That's when Chris showed up and the fight started. You have to understand that Chris is a runner and a soccer player. He's strong and fast, but also lean. Rock, on the other hand, was built. Chris was built like an NFL linebacker and just as fast, maybe even faster. One time, a guy named Rock beat Chris badly, but after that, Rock never bothered me again. He was scared of Chris. Chris never gave up, and even Rock knew that you could hurt him but never truly beat him. That's just how Chris was. When Chris played for UT, they won two national championships because he never quit. Let me tell you about the last one, and you'll get why. The game went into four overtimes. Chris was the only one still running at the end. He scored the winning goal with less than a minute left before shootouts. But you wouldn't hear this from Chris himself. Chris was modest. People liked him because he didn't act like a typical jock. He gave me the confidence to run for class president in high school, and thanks to his many friends, I won. In my eyes, Chris is the best man you'll ever meet. So why did I betray him with someone else? It's tough to explain. I take responsibility for what I did. Nobody forced me to go into that room. I walked in on my own and I could have walked out, but I didn't. I'll never forgive myself for letting that happen. I knew it was wrong, but I did it anyway. Yes, Professor King tricked me. He found out my weakness and played me. When I took his summer class, he asked me to stay after the first day. He wanted to talk about the settlement I got when my father died in a plane crash. By the end of the course, I had told him things only Chris knew. I told him my last words to my dad were angry because he was going to miss one of my soccer games. I was in second grade and mad because I wanted my dad to watch me. Dad changed his flight to get home early. When we heard about the crash, we didn't know he was on the plane until a TV reporter showed up and asked us how we felt. After hearing my story, Professor King started acting like a father to me. I loved it. Chris's dad had been great to me, but I always knew he wasn't my real dad. The week before the big OU game, Professor King invited us to his house by the lake. He talked about how his own daughter chose his cheating wife and how they hardly ever talked. I should have seen the warning signs, but I felt sorry for him instead. 
I was so happy when he found out that Chris had to stay for a class and offered to drive me to Dallas on Friday morning. Even if I'd had my usual guard up, I think his smooth talking and friendly manner would have worn me down during the three and a half hour trip. King was as charming and convincing as you would imagine a lawyer who had won millions in a big case to be. When we arrived at the hotel, it was even fancier than I thought it would be. It felt like another world, and I felt grown up as we had a couple of drinks at the bar. I didn't think much of it when he invited me to his room. He said he didn't want to be seen hanging out too much with one of his students. I'm not making excuses, only explaining that I was a little tipsy when he started talking about how sad he was because his daughter chose to live with her mother. He got me talking about my dad, and before I knew it, he was hugging me to comfort me. So there we were, both with tears on our faces. But now I know his tears weren't real. I was feeling so hurt that I didn't react when he kissed me. The idea of sex didn't cross my mind with that first kiss. I just wanted to comfort him and be comforted. But it wasn't a comforting kiss. It was full of passion, and I kissed him back. Oh, God, if only I had stopped there. Still, if that had been all, things might have been different. But it wasn't. I was a bit foggy, but when I felt his hand in my pants, I knew I had to stop him. I knew I could stop him. I wanted to stop him, but I didn't. No, I wasn't drunk. No, I didn't want to have sex with him. No, he didn't force me. For some reason I'll never understand, I decided I shouldn't stop him, and I didn't. I was wearing a skirt, and he never even took off my underwear. He just moved it aside and started having sex with me. I saw the clock as he entered me, 5.43. As he had sex with me, I did it back. No, it wasn't passion. I just wanted it to be over. I kept repeating in my head, just get through this, just get through this. At exactly 6.10, he pulled out and finished on my underwear. As he stood up, he said, I didn't want to finish inside you. I don't think Chris would like that. I didn't say anything. I just adjusted my bra and left. When I got back to my room, I flushed my underwear down the toilet and took the hottest shower I could stand. I knew what I had done. I felt dirty and like I had betrayed the only man I'd ever love. I did it with my eyes wide open and I had no excuse. I thought about it and wondered what to do. How should I tell Chris? Then I made my second big mistake. I decided we needed to leave right away to get him back to Austin before I told him. I was scared that when Chris found out what I did, he would hurt King. Don't we often make bad choices for good reasons? As I stood in the room that was supposed to be a treat for us, I saw a little note saying the sheets on our bed were very fancy. I started to cry. I had always dreamed of being with Chris on nice sheets, but I had ruined it by being unfaithful. I missed my husband more than ever and I knew things would never be the same again. I felt dirty and couldn't believe I had cheated. Chris deserved better. I remembered something from a family law class. Once a cheater, always a cheater. I loved Chris too much to let him be stuck with someone like me. I was a mess emotionally. That's the closest I'll come to trying to excuse my terrible behavior when Chris arrived. I knew that he knew what I had done, but when I saw him I realized he hadn't really accepted it yet. He was confused. I tried to use that to keep him away from King. To be honest, I think deep down I hoped I could have Chris just one more time before he left me. Silly, right? The whole lie fell apart in less than 15 minutes. I saw him at the front desk as he came in, and I hid in the ballroom. I thought he would go up to our room first, giving me a few minutes to pull myself together. I had just sat down at an empty table when King sat across from me. He started talking about how special our new relationship was and how important it was to keep it quiet. He was still trying to manipulate me. I was furious. I was about to tell him off when I felt Chris's hand on my shoulder. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I wanted to get him away from King. I meant to ask him to join me in our room to help me pack. Instead, I blurted out something silly about our sheets being very fancy. I saw his face and was about to confess when King asked me to dance. I was so angry. The last thing I wanted was to dance with him. But for some reason I agreed. On the dance floor, King kept talking about keeping our affair quiet. He told me to calm down if I didn't want Chris to get suspicious. It made me sick. The thought that I had betrayed Chris with this man was awful. I smiled at King, my sweetest smile, and said in a kind voice, I can't harm you physically, but I'll ruin you. 
I'll take your job, your money, your law license, and anything else you care about. You've cost me, Chris, and you have no idea how much you'll have to pay for that. I spat in his face and walked away. As I headed back to the table, I saw Chris leaving the room. I guessed he was going to our room and I decided I needed a few minutes to calm down before I talked to him. That's when it happened. It's called a fugue state. Let me explain. The connection between Chris and me wasn't some weird sci-fi thing like mind reading. Mostly we were just very good at understanding each other's body language. We knew each other so well that we were rarely wrong. The only strange thing was that I was always aware of Chris. You know how some wives or twins say they know when the other is in trouble, but can't explain why? That's how it was for me. A few minutes after I saw Chris leave, I suddenly couldn't sense him. He wasn't dead, but I couldn't feel him anymore. In therapy, I learned that Chris probably went into something called a fugue state. It's like dissociative amnesia, where the body keeps going, but the mind shuts down and goes somewhere dark. I was really worried. I called his phone, but it went straight to voicemail. I left a message asking where he was and if he was okay. I was so scared. I was shaking and felt lost, but somehow I made it to our room. I collapsed on the bed, a bed I knew I'd never share with him again. About an hour later, I gathered enough strength to stop feeling sorry for myself. King was going to pay. I'd told him that, and now I had to figure out how. I knew that with how schools deal with sexual harassment claims, I could get him fired. But I knew I wouldn't do that. I'm a lawyer, so I know what the law says, but I also know what's right and wrong. King charmed me. He didn't offer me grades or favors or threaten me. But he was a creep, and I was sure I wasn't the only one he had targeted. I was determined to find other students he had harassed and get him fired, just like I promised. I wanted to tell Chris I'd get revenge, but I still couldn't sense him. I'm good with words, but I can't explain how much that scared me. I figured Chris was probably on his way back to Austin. Again, I don't know how I knew he wasn't all there, but I did. I called again and his phone went to voicemail. I hoped he'd listen to my message, so I used that special voice, the one all spouses know, the voice that says this is not open for discussion. I wanted to snap him out of whatever he was stuck in, and I needed to tell him that I would get King fired for what he had done to Chris. I don't remember how I spent the next two hours. Maybe I was in my own blurry state of mind. Then suddenly a new wave of fear hit me. I was really scared for Chris. I imagined him with a gun and grabbed my phone, but it went to voicemail again. I tried to hide my fear in my voice, but I couldn't. I was crying and begging Chris. I kept telling him that what I did and who I was didn't change who he was. At one point I said something that turned out to be really important, although I didn't realize it for years. I said, we would get past this. The key word there was we. Less than two minutes later, Chris was back. I knew he wasn't okay, but for the first time in over three hours, I could sense him again. I wish I hadn't. I could feel his pain. I know that phrase is old and overused, but it was true. I had an image of King on top of me, and I lost it. His room was just a few doors down from mine, and I ran down the hall and started banging on his door. I wanted to hurt him. I know Chris felt the same way. He had already stuck his hunting knife through King's front door. All I could think about as I pounded on that door was that if Chris killed that piece of trash, he'd go to prison. Even in Texas, you couldn't get away with murder, even for a good reason. I couldn't let that happen. If someone was going to prison, it had to be me. It was the least I deserved. And then Chris was gone again. I left with him. I don't know where he went, but I ended up in a mental hospital. It was two days before I woke up. I called Mama and told her to come get me. I wasn't crazy, but I wasn't whole either. I understood what I had done to Chris, and I hated myself for it. Because we were connected, it was much worse for him. He knew there was no excuse. I had broken him and made him into something he could never have imagined. I made him feel worthless. For years, just thinking about what I did to Chris was enough to make my blood pressure shoot up. I'm not going to bore you with the sad story of my life after Chris left. I will say that it almost broke Mama. Chris was like a son to her, and she begged me to find a way to make things right. She never understood that even if Chris somehow forgave me, if he wanted me to stay with him, it would only make me lose respect for him. I could never be married to someone weak. Besides, even if we could somehow work past this, even if he trusted me like a husband should trust a wife, I could never trust myself.
I cheated and failed. I broke the most important promises you can make. By doing that, I hurt the best man I've ever met. Chris needed healing, but I couldn't help him. I was too tired and weak to heal him. What I did have was a strong need for revenge, and I got it in full. I found two students from King's summer class who had slept with him. One did it because he was scared, and the other did it for better grades. I'm not proud of the ways I made them speak up, but King was fired in front of everyone. I finished law school and passed the bar exam. I found women who worked for him and had been mistreated. I sued for them and took all his money. It took longer, but I found an old client who had been forced to sleep with him and got him banned from practicing law. How did I find these women and get them to speak up? Chris's second major was in computers. Some of his friends wanted justice, too. I gave my share of the lawsuit money to a women's shelter. All this took about four years. They were very lonely years, and my need for revenge was my whole life. Did I date? No. I know some men don't mind getting involved with someone who cheats, but I couldn't be with a person like that. There were only a few breaks in my quest for revenge. The first was when Chris brought Cindy to meet our parents. It almost broke our mom's heart, but I understood why Chris couldn't see us. It would only bring back memories of a life I ruined. Honestly, I didn't want to see him either. We had so much and it was gone. Have you ever seen Gone with the Wind? They show it every year at the Paramount, a lovely old theater in Austin. Our relationship was like the scene where you see a destroyed Twelve Oaks after the war. It was once beautiful and could never be the same again. Just thinking about it made me sad, so I tried not to think about it. I was surprised when Cindy asked to meet me on that visit. I have to admit, I had mixed feelings. On one hand, I truly wanted Chris to be happy. I wanted him to find a good woman, get married, and live a normal life. But a new problem came up. Cindy started talking about our other children. She was doing so well with her health that she could take fewer drugs, and now she wanted to have the two remaining embryos implanted. This scared me a lot. It was true that she was a great patient. The heart transplant was a near-perfect match, but not perfect enough, so she still needed her meds. This was hard for her because she felt great, even better than before she went to Africa. This led to some big, loud fights. Okay, it led to a lot of shouting and gestures from me while she just smiled calmly and argued sensibly. Her main point was that the embryos were human and we couldn't just leave them frozen forever. We argued about when a group of cells becomes a human and gets a soul. She said, since we didn't know the exact moment it happens, why take the chance? I grew up believing in a woman's right to choose, but I had to admit it didn't make much sense to decide the baby becomes human only at birth. I thought it made more sense to say the baby became human when it could live outside the mother. To me, that was human enough, and from that point, the baby should be protected. I guess that would be around the last three months of pregnancy. Isn't that what the Supreme Court said in the original Roe v. Wade? In one argument, I mentioned that the Methodist social principles supported abortion to save the mother's health and life. Have you ever heard the saying, bringing a knife to a gunfight? Never argue religion with a religious expert. I should have known better. I knew she had written books, and their sales created a good amount of money for our twins' future, but the words she'd used. If you're going to argue religion with a theologian, at least make sure you know enough Greek, Latin, and Hebrew to understand if they're making points or teasing you. In the end, I think her religious arguments were just an excuse. She had a deep connection to those embryos. Her feelings went far beyond logic. Those were her babies, and she wasn't going to let them stay frozen. I'll never forget the Sunday afternoon when I sat her down on our bed, looked into her eyes, and said, Honey, I won't let you carry those babies. You've always said that religiously I'm the head of this family. Well, this is my final decision. Do you know when you've been outsmarted? She gave me a big, sweet smile and said, So, if I find someone else to carry them, we'll have two more babies? I felt tricked, like the character Br'er Rabbit when he was thrown into the briar patch, which was actually his favorite place. I would have realized it sooner, but she started using her best argument. Her hands magically appeared inside my pants. Almost before she finished her sentence, she was using her mouth to keep me distracted. All I could do was groan, Yes! I didn't mean to give her permission to find another woman to carry the babies, but that's what it sounded like. Besides, I thought Sandy couldn't have more children, and who else would do that for us? Isn't a man's logic silly when he's not thinking straight? 
Two months later, I came home on a Friday night, and Cindy was wearing one of her nicest outfits. She had made my favorite dinner, chicken fried steak, mashed potatoes, and English peas. Then she gave me her first surprise. She had just signed a deal to write seven books in the next ten years. The amount of the advance check left me speechless. She would be earning more than I did, and she'd be working part-time from home. When she asked me to take the twins to a friend's house while she cleaned up after dinner, I knew she wanted to celebrate and talk about what this meant for our future. She promised to have everything ready by the time I returned, and as I was leaving, she called out, Wait till you see what I've got for you when you get back. Big Daddy. I didn't speed. Okay, I didn't speed while the twins were in the car. The round trip usually took a little less than an hour. Even with the time spent settling the twins and unloading their stuff, six long red lights, and getting stuck behind a slow driver, I was back in our driveway 42 minutes after I left. When Cindy went all out to surprise me, I always felt so lucky. As I walked into our bedroom, the first thing I noticed was the candle that heated a little glass bowl of scented oil. The smell was strong and had always been my favorite. There were other candles in the room, giving a soft, warm light. Cindy was in her nicest Victoria's Secret outfit, lying on my side of the bed. She had the sweetest smile on her face, the same one she had when she told me how much she loved me. But this time, I knew the smile wasn't for me. It was for someone she loved even more than me. I knew, even before I touched her, that she would never smile like that for me again. She must have died just minutes after I left. She was already cold. I pulled the covers over her to warm her. The strangest thought hit me. How could she have smiled through the pain of a heart attack? Then, I fell on the floor and cried. I don't know how long I cried. I just know that, after what felt like forever, I felt her voice saying, Chris, don't cry for me. You know where I am. Don't try to be strong. Let your friends help. The twins need you. It wasn't that I actually heard her voice. It was a feeling, a warmth in my body, and I knew what she wanted me to do. I don't believe in ghosts, but I will always believe that her spirit or something was with me. My pain was still there, but no one will ever convince me that Cindy left without saying goodbye. Somehow, I was able to call 911, and I even helped the paramedics move her onto their cart. They knew her from her volunteer work at our local hospital, and one of them had tears in her eyes. That helped me feel a little bit better. I know that paramedics try not to show their feelings at work, but I also knew that this team wouldn't treat Cindy's body without care. They would show respect. The police were there, too. One of them was Cindy's friend. I knew they had to ask questions, but it didn't feel like an investigation. It felt like a friend sharing my sadness. I don't know who called the couple taking care of the twins. Maybe it was the same person who called Cindy's parents, Sandy, and my parents. I was in shock. I couldn't go into our bedroom. Instead, I went to my chair in the den. Someone put soft music on our CD player and the den started to fill with church people. Someone might have talked to me, but I don't think they did. When Cindy had me read the book of Job with her, I said that Job's friends weren't very helpful. Cindy said they had torn their clothes and sat in silence with him for a long time, maybe more than a week. They didn't give bad advice until Job asked. I didn't think much of it at the time, but as I sat in my chair, I understood. Sometimes there are no words. Silence is harder than saying things that don't help. Sometimes the best thing you can do is sit quietly and share your friend's pain. I didn't sit there for seven days, but I didn't sleep that night. In the morning, my body's needs made me get up. Then I realized two things. First, Cindy had great friends. In time, 12,253 people signed her registers. The largest Methodist church in Philly was overflowing, and people stood all around it outside. People lined the road as we took her to the cemetery. Yes, Cindy had great friends. Thousands of people wanted to help me for her sake. But the second thing I realized was that I didn't have any close friends of my own. I had many people who liked me and whom I liked, but I didn't have someone who would sit in silence with me through my pain. No, that's not true. There was one person closer to me than even a sibling. In my grief, there was still anger that Lorelei wasn't there for me. What she did didn't just cost me a wife, but my very best friend, too. She made me feel so alone, and that pain almost broke me. I don't need to tell you all the details of burying my wife. 
If you've ever buried your spouse, you understand. If you've been lucky not to, there's no way to know the feeling of having a part of you buried in that box in the ground. Why do they always cover fresh dirt with that fake grass? If you haven't been there, you won't get how hard it is to see a backhoe pushing dirt onto someone you love. I shouldn't have stayed to watch the grave being covered, but I thought I needed to be there at the end, to say goodbye the way I used to, just like when she was in the hospital. I expected something special to happen. I thought maybe there would be a sign from God showing he was happy to have one of his special people with him. But all I got was a breeze in my face and the smell of the flowers. She loved fresh flowers. A month later, I was opening the sympathy cards I got each day since Cindy passed. Then I saw it. A card with no return address and my address was typed, but I knew it was from Lorelei. I didn't need to open it to know what was inside, but I did. It was a beautiful birthday card and an appointment card, just like the one I found the night Cindy died, an appointment card for the fertility clinic. Tomorrow is my birthday, and I am scared. I have a choice to make, and I don't know what to do. Please tell me, what would you do? Hey, listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video with Queen Cheating Tales.